here. Uh, But I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 16. While you're doing that, I want to say thank you to everybody who's blessed us with a gift. Man, it's been so it's been so special being a part of this church a month in now. It is a month in, basically. And uh, just the love that we feel, our family feels. Thank you for the million gift cards because we have burned up all of them, man. Our kids eat way more than I thought they did. And, uh, and thank you for just honoring us and blessing us. And, and we're just so thankful, my wife and I, uh, to, to lead this church. And I'm ready to preach this word today. I have fought all week on this message. Uh, I've rewritten it three different times. And uh, I even stayed up late last night, which is not, I'm not a Saturday prepper. I am done by Thursday. So to wrestle with a message for this long tells me two things. Uh, Number one, that it's got to be the word of the Lord. And number two, the enemy has tried to do everything he can to stop it. But he's not going to win. Acts chapter 16. Let me give you a little context on what's going on here. Paul, been planting churches for years. For the cause of Jesus Christ. He's primarily planted in, in Asia, loves going to Asia, what's modern day Turkey, loves it, loves, loves all the people that he's met there, and he has great success. So he gets ready to head out on his next missionary journey. And where is he going to go? He's going to go back to the place of familiarity. He wants to go to Asia, but God had other plans. Isn't that like the Lord? Like you, you just make a plan and you're like, this is what we're going to do. And then God just says, no. And he moves you in a different direction. And God, God, God draws him to Macedonia. He draws him to Greece. And, and what happens in this next chapter of Paul's life is incredible the way the church explodes there. God had a plan. Paul saw a good opportunity to go to Asia. But how many know good opportunities aren't always God opportunities? And God, God moved him to where he wanted him to go. And man, the Lord poured it out. So picking up in Acts chapter 16, we're going to read verses 13 through 34 today. Verse 13, on the Sabbath, he went outside the city gate on the river. This is him, Paul and Silas, where he expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and we began to speak to the women that had gathered there. One of them listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. So she has money. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's messages. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay with me in my house as she persuaded us. Let me stop right there. Things are going really good. Paul says yes. He shows up in Greece, immediately has a crowd. Immediately people are getting baptized and saved. He meets this lady that is, that is so important in, in Scripture that the, the Lord calls her out by name and even says what she does for a living. So clearly she's helping Paul in this chapter get established. But then like everything's going well and then we come to verse 16 and everything changes. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had been with a spirit she had predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept up this way for many days. Finally, Paul, so annoyed, he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to get up out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. I mean, there's no name like the name of Jesus. Verse 19, when her owners realized their hope was making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and they're throwing our whole city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept and practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, somebody say midnight. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, everyone's chains came loose and the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped but Paul shouted don't harm yourself we're all here verse 29 the jailers called for the lights rushed in and fell trembling before the Paul and Silas he then brought them out and asked sirs what must I do to be saved 
They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that just a whole house got saved? I want to preach on this thought this morning, worshiping when it seems wrong. Worshiping (coughs) when it seems wrong. How about I pray for you and you pray for me? Does that sound good? So does that sound good today? The Heavenly Father, Lord, every person under the sound of my voice, Lord, I know that you wrote this message with somebody in mind. So Lord, I'm thankful to deliver it, but Lord, I pray that we would be receptive to your word and what you're trying to say. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. So, I, this story is great. I love everything about it. I love the worship. I love, I love all this. But I can't help but kind of think about people's journey in ministry when you watch this. They start off, they have really great success. They meet Lydia. They got crowds. Lydia's whole squad gets saved. Everybody down by the, down by the river gets saved. Everybody, it's like they have a lot of success right off the bat. And then, wham, here comes this other lady who's crazy and he does exactly what he's supposed to do, and he, he casts this demon out of this woman, and all of a sudden, everything just goes south. They're beaten, they're humiliated, they're held without trial, they're placed in a nasty, dark cell in the inside of the prison, locked up. Talk about a mission strip gone bad, this is it. Talk about the old bait and switch from the good Lord. This is, this is what it feels like right now. I can't help but imagine what's going through their mind as they're like, Lord, as they're sitting in the cell, cell and they've been beaten almost to the point of death, and they're like, God, like, what are you doing? You literally told me to do that, and now look at this. Look at where I end up. Look at how much pain I'm in because I said yes to what you told me to do. And so I want to give you five, just five observations from Acts 16 today. Five observations. If you're taking notes, there's, there's opportunities to take notes uh, uh, on our bulletin and then and some cards that are in the seat back pocket on your phone. I encourage you to do that. Five observations. The first one is this. The crowd that loved them one moment is the same crowd that attacked them the next. The crowd that loved them one moment, right at the beginning, is the same crowd that attacks them next. Whoops up on them, pulls the rods out, beats them. I don't know about you. I've been spanked before, but I've never been spanked with a rod like that. Like, I can't imagine the beating that they went through. But the crowd, crowds are fickle, okay? I told you I grew up in a, in a small uh, church of God where it, for worship, they just said, all right, if you want to sing, just come up on stage. Like, there's only 50 people in the church, 25 people on stage, right? And it's just half the crowd comes up and sings. No one's practiced. It was awesome. But I, uh, I, I love to sing. I joined the choir, man, as a kid. I still love to worship. You may see me down here doing some stuff. And uh, I, I remember singing. And man, you know mamas. Mamas will lie to you. Like, they'll tell you, you're the best singer, son. You are, your voice is phenomenal. Like it's all, and I have an okay voice, but I'm not out here winning the voice or anything like that. I'm not an American Idol candidate. Uh, and... I remember singing in church and singing specials in church with the youth choir and stuff like that and feeling really good about myself. And the time came, I was 16 years old. I wrestled in high school, loved loved sports, loved to compete. And uh, we had a wrestling tournament at the school. And this is how ghetto my school was. If you, for a sound system, they had a little boom box with a CD player and they put the microphone in front of it. And that's how we would play the national anthem. Well, one day the boom box didn't work. Didn't work. And so they were like, okay, we got 10 teams, 350 people in this gym. Like, we got to sing the national anthem to get this thing started. What are we going to do? And I raised my hand and said, you know what? I'll bear this burden. I will do this for you guys. <laughs> now, singing is one thing, but if you've ever sang the national anthem, you know that it's not as easy as people make it out to be. Like, it, it's got some humdingers in there that they're just like, if you aren't ready and you're, if you aren't warmed up, you're just not going to hit. So I'll never forget. I just began to sing and everything was flowing so well. And I got to the part where like, in the land of the free. And I, the 12 year old me came back into the 16 year old me body. And I was like, land of the free. <laughs> and I squeaked so bad. At the highest point, and, but I sold it, boy. I squeaked it till the end, boy. And 
The rest of the time uh, in high school, everyone would just walk by me and go, free. <laughs> the crowded church loved my singing, but boy, when I made a mistake in front of that non-church crowd, they did not let me go, buddy. Let me tell you why. That hung over me for the longest time. Uh, and here's why you can't stay hung up on pleasing everyone, because the opinion of the crowd, it always shifts. It always changes. It changes depending upon place, uh, season, the weather, you name it. Like people, and if you're living for the joy of the crowd, if you're living for the applause and you're living for the the approval of man, I want you to know something you probably uh, have figured out by now, that your joy and your happiness are always very short-lived. Because as long as you're dependent upon the crowd to cheer you on, you're going to need a crowd to follow you everywhere. You're going to need the approval of everybody. And uh, I knew a long time ago that I would not be one of the preachers who preaches to tickle ears. I'm not here, I'm not here to be mean. That's not because Jesus doesn't preach violent and angry. That's not, not what I'm saying. But there's a lot of pastors who've become TED Talk people and not preachers of the word, and I'm not going to be one of those. I gave up on the crowd a long time ago when the crowd shunned me for squeaking when I sang the national anthem. Like, I moved on. Like, if they're not going to be about me, I'm not going to be about them. And for but many of us, man, we fall into this trap, whether that's social media or our life or just trying to keep up with the Joneses where we're doing everything we can for the approval of the crowd and you're just living your life with anxiety and tension. But if you'll live your life for the approval of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, then you'll find peace in a way. That's not, give the Lord praise. You'll find peace and joy in a way you've never found it. You've never found it before. You can't bank on the crowd. The crowd, it loves you one minute, it can't stand you the next. And if you don't stand for something in this world, you'll fall for anything. You gotta stay committed to God and committed to his word despite where the crowd wants to take you or wants to take your life. Second observation is this. They got in trouble for doing the right thing. Talk about a conversation with the Lord. There's one. Lord, I did. They got in trouble for doing the right thing. Like, if I was them, I'd be arguing with the Lord. Like, I just cast a demon out in your name, and yet you let them beat me up and put me in prison. Anyone ever get in trouble for doing the right thing, man? That's always the worst. I I grew up in a house, big house. Well, not a big house, a big family. We had a tiny house. And... uh, my younger brother, I call him Big Juicy. His name's Andrew. And uh, Andrew is, was a colorer of the walls. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Your kids just draw on stuff. Our kids, Judah drew all over his like suede rocking chair the other day. Just drew all over it for kicks and giggles. And uh, my brother used to climb behind the couch and he'd write bad words. I don't know who was teaching him the bad words, okay? <laughs> we grew up in a holiness household. There ain't nobody saying no bad words in our house. And so somewhere he would write, he would write bad words. Well, I discovered it one day and I discovered him writing it. And so I I, I decided I was going to, I was going to snitch. I was going to do the right thing. I got out of Sunday school and man, they told me that I just needed to be open and honest. So I was going to be open and honest about what I've seen. So I remember going to my mom and saying, listen, somebody's been writing bad words behind the couch. She was like, what? I said, yep. And it was Andrew. And my mom slides that couch back, and the, here is like a Jackson Pollock painting of all the things my brother's written. But my brother had a backup plan, because not only did he write bad words, but he wrote my name over and over and over again. <laughs> and I remember my mom commenced a whooping on my tail. She did not believe my side of the story. There was no, there was no way that I, that I didn't write all that, is what she thought. My name is written everywhere. My brother's just giggling, you know, just like crafty. I got the worst spanking ever for telling the truth and being honest. And and maybe you're in this boat where you're serving God faithfully, but everything just seems to be going really wrong. And you're looking at God wondering, what are you doing? Here you have Paul and Silas who get beat for doing exactly what God called them to do to go and reach the people. He obeyed God and he suffered for it. And I learned this. I think this is very true. I want you to write this down. Sometimes following Jesus costs something you wouldn't pay if you knew you had to pay it ahead of time. Sometimes following Jesus, it costs something so large and so harsh that if you knew about it ahead of time, you wouldn't pay that price. If God gave you plan A, 
which was smooth sailing and okay, or plan B, that was wrought with pain and discomfort, but he would be there. If we're being real honest, we're not going to pick plan B. We're not going to choose pain right off the bat. I don't care how holy you think you are. Uh, If I say, hey, can I punch you in the face or you can walk away? You're going to walk away. You're not going to let me punch you in the face. And sometimes I think if we knew, why does God withhold from us a lot of things about the next chapter of our life? Because he knew if you knew every little detail about what's hard, you would probably pass up. But for every difficult thing I've ever gone through by saying yes to Jesus, I have found peace, joy, and fulfillment in greater ways than any pain than I could have ever faced. And maybe you're in that realm today where you're You know that you said yes to this calling of God. You asked Jesus into your heart. You said yes to lead uh, a small group, or you said yes to do a ministry, and you feel like you're getting strung out to dry because life is hard. Just because you said yes to Jesus doesn't mean you said no to drama, people, issues, uh, problems, pain. It just means that when you said yes to Jesus, you said yes to go through all of those things with him together. That's the best part about a relationship with Christ is whether you know Christ or not, you will face this thing called life. It's full of problems and issues. But what makes a believer make it the way that non-believers don't make it is the fact that they have Christ Jesus walking every step of the way with them. Anybody thankful that Christ never walked away from you and that he's been with you the whole time? Like, I'm thankful that even when I've made the wrong turn on my own, God has gently directed me back. To where I need to go. Paul made a choice with his life. He made a choice with his life to take territory from the enemy, to take back humanity and to invest into Greece and to plant churches and to plant, plant ministries. And I know this to be true. The more ground you take from the enemy, the more the enemy is going to try and stop you because the devil in fears an empowered church. A church that knows the potential of the Christ that lives in them and the power in the name of Jesus and a church that believes in miracles and a church that worships and a church that's willing to serve the community without ever wanting anything back. He fears that. He fears an empowered church. And if you're under attack today, maybe you should take it as a compliment that the devil is so scared of you that he's doing everything he can from discouraging you on this journey called faith. And maybe, and, 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 and maybe that word alone is just for me. Because this week has been wrought with all sorts of just setbacks, setups, disappointments, things falling apart, truck falling apart. I, I, I didn't even wear socks one day. I left my socks at home. <laughs> all trying to prep this message. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not a Saturday writing person. I'm a Thursday person. I like my Fridays and Saturdays. That's for my kids. That's for my kids and my family. That's our time together. And I fought this so hard, and my dad gently reminded me, you have such a word in your heart that you can't express, but the devil's trying to suppress it because it's going to change somebody's life. And it's not because I'm preaching it, it's because somebody is on the edge of a really dark moment today, and you need to know that there's hope in Jesus Christ, and that there's joy, and that there's peace. The devil might be trying to do everything he can to shut down your family and your marriage, but listen... That ship hasn't sailed yet. As long as Jesus is around, there's still going to be hope. My third observation is this. If you're taking notes, God had a rescue plan. God had a rescue plan for his missionaries. They didn't know it. They didn't, they might have, who knows what they were thinking when they got beaten and arrested. There's, in fact, there's no way that Paul and Silas knew that when they got beaten with rods and thrown in jail, that they were going to sing their way out. There's no way. Now, you and I have the luxury of reading Scripture from the present tense, so we get to look back and see how God miraculously moves. But these people are living it real time. Real time. And they're in the middle of this dark moment where I honestly, I would be arguing with the Lord a little bit. Especially when I, when I looked in the mirror and saw all the black eyes that I got from getting beat with rods. I would be questioning God. But Paul didn't know he was going to get out. But yet he chose to sing. Anyways, he probably thought, 
You know what? I'm just going to worship because I'm dead anyways. I ain't getting out of this, this place. He didn't just get thrown in jail. The Bible says he got put in the inner jail, like in the inside, inside, in like the darkest, deepest spot. And not only that, did they put him in a hole he couldn't climb out of, but they chained him up down there just in case he thought about getting out. Like every reason that the devil threw everything he could at him in this moment. And if you're going to, if you're going to serve God, you need to know this. You try to take territory from the enemy, he's going to fight you back. He's going to fight you back. But my word says in Isaiah 54, 17, that no weapon formed against me will prosper. Now, it doesn't say that the weapon won't hurt. It doesn't say that there's no weapons. It just says that whatever you face, whatever gets thrown at you, whatever the devil tries to wield and cut you with and cut your family apart with and cut your self-esteem apart with, that it's not going to beat you. It's not going to be you because inside of you is a power that's greater than anything the devil could ever wield at you, throw at you, or destroy your emotions with. Inside of you is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and it's his peace that we lean in. Why? Why? Why won't the weapon prosper? It's because as long as you have Jesus, you got hope. You got hope. God has a rescue plan for whatever situation that you're in. There's a rescue plan for whatever situation that you're in, whether that's marriage, whether that's sickness, whatever it could be. There's a rescue plan because at the end of this, at the end of this journey, heaven is the end destination, and that's the the ultimate rescue plan. My mom struggled with sickness her entire life, fibromyalgia, Crohn's, uh, diabetes. My mom died all of a sudden. I preached my mom's funeral, and I and I just talked about this concept of praying for healing for my mom her entire life, but never seeing it. And that the Lord corrected me as I was prepping that message and said, you prayed for her to get healed. You, you just don't like the way that I healed her. Like God has an escape plan for whatever thing we're facing. It might not be the way that you planned it or the way that you want it, but God has an escape plan. And if, let me tell you what, if you're a non-believer in the room, maybe you're, you're testing this this church thing, maybe you're trying Jesus out, you're not really committed to him, I want you to know this, that whatever situation you've backed yourself into and whatever situation you've gotten into, that if you give your heart to Jesus Christ today, he'll change your life in a way. Can I get an amen from somebody? He'll change your life in a way that you never saw coming and you never even thought that you needed. Because God, before you ever, ever wandered into this church, God had a rescue plan for you. It's called Jesus Christ. It's called Jesus Christ. There, number four is this. So the fourth observation is their praise set everyone else free. Their praise set everyone else free. Their singing just flung the doors open. Now, for some of y'all, if y'all started singing, the doors would fling open because we try to get out because it's so bad. But like their praise set everyone else free. And I'm going to talk about worship for just a moment. And uh, worship is such a critical part for you and I as believers. It's critical, and uh, I believe that worship should be a natural part of our expression to Christ for all that he's done for us. And you might not sing the praises of other people, but other people haven't died for you and given their heart for you and healed you and saved your family. And so it's easy for me to worship God when I take into account of all that he's done for me. I think worship is a key. It's a key that unlocks the presence of God in a way that silence never could. And so why do we encourage people to worship? Because as we lift his name up, he enters in. He enters into the house. He enters into moments. I believe that worship is a key that can unlock things in your life that being quiet just it's not going to do. It's not going to do. And then I believe that worship is a weapon. That the enemy cannot stand and doesn't want to hear. And, and like, uh, right? Like, the devil was a worship leader in heaven before he got kicked out. And he got upset because Christ received worship. And so, why is worship critical? Because it still gets under the skin of the devil. And I'm okay with that. But if I'm going to be honest, like, worship, and when I say we, I mean the big C church. I'm not picking on restoration, I'm picking on the church body as a whole. I think we've gotten it wrong. I think we've gotten it wrong, and I, don't, I said earlier I think it's the last 20 years, but I think it's been for a long time. I think it's been for a long time that we have, we've come into a house and we've expected our worship team, which is awesome, to do our job for us. And we come in as, um, not as participators, but as spectators. 
and we love it when they sing, and it's awesome. It's not that we have a problem with it. We just, man, we love, we love Pastor Luke and the worship that he's bringing. We love to hear them sing, but they're not singing for you. They're singing for him, and if they thought it worthy enough to get here at 6.30 a.m., practice, plan, and get in here and worship God, if they found him worthy enough to do that, then we should find him worthy enough to lift our hands and to lift our voice. But I think we've gotten it wrong. We show up like this is some kind of oil change appointment for, spirit, for our spiritual oil change. And we come in and we hope that this only takes about 15 minutes because we've got to go to the grocery store. And we hope that God can just really quickly do what we need to do. And if the church is supposed to be the bride of Christ, this isn't even in my notes. If the church is supposed to be in the, the bride of Christ, okay, I think about our wedding day. And how much joy you had coming down the aisle to see me. And how much joy I had. Because, I mean, whatever, you know. She was more. She, but I think about, like, when you got, if you'd have got down there with a sour face, I might would have turned around to Big Juicy and be like, we got to get out of here. You're the bride of Christ. And to come into his presence to meet him and be upset. Or, or be silent and be non-participatory in whatever he's trying to do and to just to let him talk about how much he loves us and he's proven our worth and we're just like, yep, hopefully this doesn't take long, Lord. Man, what are we doing? What are we doing? I think there's a shifting taking place. I think there's a shifting taking place in, in the world and the church. I think God's tired of hearing us sing songs about ourselves. And listen, this isn't the old and the new thing because let me tell you what, that whole, the, I want to take a trip on a good old gospel ship is not even biblical. It's not. Look it up. We used to sing a song called The Great Speckled Bird. Like, what? It's not an old or a new thing. God is in the business of receiving adoration and praise and the glory that's due his name. Amen. Not my name, not your name. And there's this shifting, I think, that's taking place. And I think that you're going to come in here, prophetically speaking, you're going to come in here one Sunday, and people are going to be worshiping their heart out all over the place, and there will be barely anyone on stage. And we're not going to be, we're not going to be putting words on the screen and all that because God's going to show up so big one day, and you're going to go, wait, 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 wait. Where's the people that were supposed to do this for me? Where's the people that are on the stage? They're supposed to be singing this for me. And there's going to come a moment in revival where you have to produce a song that comes naturally from your own heart. And worship, worship matters so much to God. Like the way you handle his presence matters so much to him. It matters so much to God in this moment, going back to the story, that their worship is so powerful that God doesn't just set them free. He sets the whole jailhouse free. Just let's open this whole thing up. Let's set everybody free. His worship opens the door for the jailer's family to get saved. The Bible, what I love is that it said immediately they got baptized. Like he took them to their house. He preached the gospel and they didn't say, let's get some sleep. It's 2 a.m. He's like, no, you got to baptize me now. Like God is moving in such a strong way and it's released because because of the praise and the worship of this group. Man, your praise can set, set things free. What if, what if, I'm going to ask you this question. What if your praise is the key for someone else to get free? What if you singing and worshiping in a moment that everybody knows your life is upside down and they see you worshiping God? What if that is never about you, but man, you release something in their life and their heart that if Susie can go and worship God in the middle of what she's got, I'm going to worship him on my way out the door. Like, I'm going to worship. Like, what if it's, what, what is God trying to do in your own life that your worship is keeping him from doing? What is your lack of worship keeping God from maneuvering and doing and pouring out in your life. There's something special about worship that, that, that removes me off of the throne of my own heart. And it just puts Jesus back where he belongs. We're human, guys. We're human. Sometimes we kick him off. Sometimes your pastor, uh, you know, he's, I have a flesh, okay? Sometimes I get upset. Uh, but I need Jesus to sit on my throne, I need him to guide my heart. I need Jesus to sit on my throne in Walmart and in traffic and all the, like I need him. 
I, need, I don't know about y'all, but I need God to show up. But worship is this, this holy reset of our own hearts and our own minds, and it puts the attention that is do God's name back in his name and back towards him. And maybe the lack that you're experiencing in life or the fact that you don't feel God has nothing to do with God not wanting to reach you, but he's just waiting on you to worship him in spirit and in truth with your whole heart. Amen. The fifth and final point, and I'm going to kind of camp out here for a while, is this. When they had every reason to quit, they chose to praise. When they had every reason to quit, they chose to praise. You know, uh, a lot of people confuse joy and happiness. Joy and happiness. Happiness is purely circumstantial. I'm happy because I'm happy. Sometimes as, as you know, I'm happy because I bought myself something. Man, I, I like to buy things. I like to buy uh, anything to do with cooking. So like any kind of barbecue seasoning. Just, I can, if, I'm, if I'm having a bad day, I run up to Academy and just get a thing of barbecue sauce. <laughs> like, oh, I'll use this at home. Man. We got like 25 million seasonings and sauces in our house. Or I'll buy, a, you know, I'll buy a gun or I'll buy some hunting clothes or something. And uh, I feel good about that, but then it doesn't take long for me to just be derailed, right? Because my happiness was based on something else. It's not based upon an identity. And joy, joy uh, is a choice. Amen. Joy is a mindset. It's choosing to have gratitude in a moment when you could complain and you could talk about everything going wrong and you could talk about what's not going right. Joy is choosing to say, you know what? I'm thankful for what I got. I'm thankful for It's choosing to be half full in a world full of half empty people. Like I, joy, it's a choice. And, it, and let's just be real. It's a hard one to make sometimes. It's hard. It's hard to pick joy when you get here and it's pouring down rain and you don't have an umbrella and the only parking spot is down there by the road. Like that's, that's hard to be, I just can't wait to get in there, you know? You know, maybe we need to have a, it was raining so hard this morning, I thought we need to have a change of clothes for some people by the time you walked across the parking lot. It's a choice. And just like salvation, it's a choice that your mama can't make for you and your daddy can't make for you, your spouse can't make for you. If you, I had made a commitment in this season in the middle of the wildness called the Warwick family right now, that I'm going to choose joy. I'm going to choose joy in front of my kids. They're not going to see my frustration. Like, I'm going to choose joy with my spouse. We talked about it last night. We are just texting. We're separated, right? She's living in Noonan, and I'm living up here because I'm commuting back and forth, and we're trying to move. And, and I just said, you know what? I, she said, you know, I wouldn't want to do this journey with anyone else but you. Uh, my wife could complain. Listen, she, she had to put all three kids down by herself. Like, she could, she could have texted me and complained, but we're choosing to be thankful in a moment that life is stressful. And maybe for you today, that's, that's where you are. You need a choice. You need to choose joy. You need to be joyful, which means you're full of joy. Not joy empty, but joy full. If you're good, you choose how full you are of joy. You choose how full you are. And the more you learn to trust God, the more you realize that even when he sets you out uh, on a journey and you end up in a little bit of prison and you end up in a little bit of pain and you end up in a little bit of drama, that God is still the same in the cell as he was out here in the crowd. Like he's still there. And you, you begin to say, it's not that you love hard times, but you begin to say, Lord, I, I trust you. God, I trust you in this moment. I learned a long time ago, and, and I learned this lesson the hard way, okay, that your emotions can either run you or you can run your emotions. Like, your emotions are either going to run you or you can run your emotions. I learned that your emotions can run you out of a job. I learned that your emotions can ruin your marriage. I learned that bad, un, un, unchecked emotions can ruin relationships and all those things. So you can either choose to let the circumstance own you or you can own the circumstance. And as the band makes their way up and we close, but Paul and Silas had every reason to not worship. They had every reason to not worship. They had every reason to complain. They had every reason to quit, yet they chose to sing. I, I don't know about you, but I, like when I'm in hard times, uh, especially if I just got beat up, I wouldn't be like, you know what we need to do right now? Get your hymn book out. Let's sing. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not. I'm going to be looking for an ice pack. What I found with the devil is that in, in hard times, he gives you so many emotional excuses. 
on why you shouldn't be in the church and why you shouldn't deal with this and why you should run and why your family's not going to make it and why you are just as bad as your mama and your granddaddy. You're just walking in that generational curse. And he gives you all of these emotional things. He gives you an emotional excuse on why you should stop following God and why you should take your emotions and act on them in a way that he wants you to be and go. And every like hyper-emotional decision I've ever made, it's always bad. Like when I'm mad and I have to choose, it's almost always bad. It's almost always bad. It's, it's in moments when I have joy that uh, I, I, I find I make the best decision. It's not moments when I have everything right. It's moments when I have joy. And as I was writing this this week, man, I just got in my mind like just a picture of some people. And for someone, man, your life's been hard. Your life has literally, it's been hard. It's been hard by hard standards. And you're not sure what to even think about it. You're not even sure. You're not even sure how you feel about the Lord in this moment. Because you ended up beaten and in a jail cell because you did what God was trying to tell you to do. Or maybe, maybe you're in this room today and you're in a stressful place. You're in a place of great anxiety, in a place where, if you were honest, you feel like God's forgotten about you. If you live in that land, it's a dangerous place to be. If you remain in that seat, it can be a dangerous place to be. And there have been many times in my life where I have just wanted to quit. Where I've wanted to just walk away. I'm, I'm, not the, I'm, not a, I'm a fight person, not a flight person. But when, one thing I don't like is like wasting my time. And when I feel like I've wasted my time on a journey, I, it's easy for me to cut ties and walk away. And there's been a lot of times where my flesh had said, you should walk away and quit. But the Lord has held me steady and in a moment. And honestly, it's been a moment that I've been frustrated with him wondering what I should do. And for someone in here, your life's been hard. You're not sure what to even think about the Lord. But I know God told me to say this. And as they play, as I, know, I know God told me to say this, that you need to hold on because it's 1159. Because it's 1159. God showed up at midnight. And I can't imagine how much they wrestled with God on every hour leading up. It's almost as if the devil had owned every minute until 1159. I know it's hard, but it's 1159. I know the doctor said that there's no hope, but it's 1159. And he's Jehovah Rapha. He's the God who sees. I know it's hard. And you feel like no one can see you and that you're all alone and God's forgotten about you. But he's El Roy. He's the God who sees. I know that life is hard. I know your kids are strung out on crack and they haven't come back. But it's 1159 and God's calling a son or daughter home. I know that life is hard. I know you want to quit, but it's 1159. And if you would just hold on, midnight's coming. Midnight's coming and when you lift your voice and you lift your praise to God, he ascends in a way and he breaks chains and he shifts families and he does things in your life that you never thought he could. 1159 may seem like a bad time to you but he's right on time at midnight he's right on time in the moment that you need I can say this to you is there anybody who's going to stand and witness and say I'm not quitting it's 11.59 I ain't quitting no more I'm not walking out I'm staying with God it's been hard it's 11.59 my family's breaking free. My marriage is breaking free. My praise is breaking free. If the devil was going to kill me, he should have killed me when he had the chance because he's under my feet. Anybody in here give him praise. Give the Lord praise. <laughs> I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting on his word. I'm not quitting on my kids. I'm not quitting on my wife, and I'm not quitting on my King Jesus. Is there anybody who just could say, man, I want to be in that boat? Like somebody, man. I just got overwhelmed last night sitting at a desk in tears because there's somebody, you're just trying to walk, you want to walk away from God. 
You want to quit? You're tired? Like your body hurts? You're just done with people? But Jesus is not done with you. He's not done. And there's still time on the clock. And God wants to move in a real and a raw way. Thank you. Here, here's the thing about midnight is that you're closer to the next sunrise than you are the next sunset. And I read in my word that joy comes in the morning. And for somebody today, it's midnight. But you know what? 12 o'clock is the start of a new day. It's somebody you've been far from God. And you showed up today for the first time in a long time and you thought it was by chance but long before you decided to show up God was working on a preacher with a word that you just need to come home that you need to come home to God that even in the middle of the hard times man God's got a plan for you and your wife your kids and everybody in your house God's going to do something in your house in fact I want every altar worker to come down now they got lanyards on. They wear them because they just want you to know that they're, they're ready to pray over you. This altar's open. If you want to come pray with somebody, pray with somebody. If you want to come down here and find a place to pray, come down and find a place to pray. Midnight. It may seem like a terrible time to be awake, but God works the late shift. And he's here in the house in the middle of your midnight hour. God's about to move in a way that's never happened before. So if you need God to touch you in a real way, I want you to come down here right now, find a place in the altar, find somebody to pray with, let them pray with you, and let God do in a moment what you've not been able to do your entire lifetime. Give your heart to him today. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, you can come. They're going to worship Lord. I just lift your name today. I thank you that you've never given up on any soul in this house. You've never given up on anybody who's run from you. And Lord, even those of us who know you but are frustrated with you, you're with us. You're right with us. And it's 1159, but Lord, midnight's here. And as we lift our voices and we lift our worship to you, God, you set us free in the way you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. If you have a need, would you come and would you worship?
your journey with Christ, there's just something about lifting his name that brings peace and joy back into a cold heart. And I'm so thankful today for what God's doing in the lives of the people in our church. And I'm just so thankful to be in his presence today, and I'm thankful for his word. So one more time, can we just give Jesus a praise? Come on. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? And, and if you're praying in the altar, you can keep praying. They're going to keep playing. I'm going to ask uh, that uh, Pastor Tyler and Megan come up, and I want every member of our, our pastor's council to come forward. Um, you can bring the house lights up a little bit. How many of you are thankful for this couple and all that they've done in this house? There's, there's like nothing more awkward than doing this several times, right? Because yeah. you feel like, how do I keep, how do I keep the emotions under control? Uh, y'all can step this way. Let them get behind you. Uh, I want to be a church. Let me just say this. I want to be a church that's ascending church. Amen. That's not worried about somebody... Uh, taking a job somewhere this is the kingdom thing and God is it, I want to be able to raise up your sons and daughters and send them out into ministry like I want to see God do incredible things and what I know about this next opportunity for y'all's family is because you're receiving it because you've been diligent and you've served you literally if you had it you could walk around with a towel on your shoulder and it would just seem comfortable because you've always served the vision of those who've been in authority over you and I think that the Lord honors that. I think every great opportunity that you walk in is not because you're like super talented or all those things. It's because you have chosen the path of honor. And you've served other people with all of your heart, both of you. I mean, I think about, I said this in the first uh, service, think about all the kids that are going to be in heaven and their kids. Because you said, you know, like you gave, your, you, you preached the word to them. And you took them on retreat when they didn't bring any money because their parents didn't give them anything. Like you, you, you did all these things and you sacrificed and who knows the amount of nights that either one of you could have been at home with your kids, but you were serving the house. And I pray a blessing over your kids that they would just know Jesus to be such a special person that mommy and daddy have given their heart to him and their life to him and that they can do the same thing. And so I want to pray over this next season. And I, I said this to, you know, you worry, you know, when you move, you're worried about, are we going to find friends or family or are our kids going to find friends or is the school going to be weird that they're going to show up at? There's just so many things that, that are involved in transition, but the Lord knows every single one of those needs and desires and things you've prayed for. And he's going to bless you with those because you have given your whole heart and life to the Lord and his kingdom. And so I want you as an act of support to just stretch your hands this way and let's pray a blessing over this family. Lord, I just thank you for Tyler and Megan. I thank you for them and their kids. I pray right now in this next season, God, that you would bless them above all they could ask, think, or imagine, that you would anoint them, God, from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. And Lord, as they step into this new chapter uh, in ministry, God, away from this house, Lord, I pray that they would find a home in their new church, God, in a new house, that they would find family and friends and their kids would find lifelong friends and that, God, you would do such a special work in their life that as we watch them grow and them develop, Lord, we can sit back and say, we got to love on this family while they were here. We got to celebrate this family while they serve this house so faithfully. Lord, bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can you give it up for this great group? Proud of you, dude. They... Uh, they're gonna after they hug it all out they're gonna go out to the auditor uh, to the lobby and i encourage you on your way out if they've done anything for you for your family been a part of your family i want you to just bless them on the way out the door if you want to give them a gift you can if you want to hug them and just tell them maybe maybe a great moment or a highlight that you have with them i know that they would deeply appreciate that so they're going to make their way out into that lobby before the crowd gets there and uh Tell them you love them. Bless them on the way out the door. I want to I wanna invite you back next week, man. I feel like this Easter season, God is going to do something super special in our house. He's already doing things that I never thought he would do. But man, this Easter season is going to be awesome. And then April 16th, I want you to put it down on your calendar. Vision Sunday. God's got something special I know he wants to share with us in this house. And so I bless you, and I hope you have the best week full of joy, and I'll see you back. Thank you, guys.